have Dr. Hong. Dr. Hong is a fellow of the World Academy of Science, the Malaysian Academy of Science, and is a distinguished chair professor of Zhejiang University, China. He's a formal, former principal scientist at the International Rice Research Institute, Philippines, and he's recognized internationally as an authority on science, technology, and the implementation of pest ecology, biodiversity, ecological engineering, farmers' decision-making, and pest manage ma management. Sorry, that's a mouthful for me, but it's a pleasure to have you join us, Dr. Jiang, and he's going to keep his his video off because of his internet, um, but you see his smiling face there, and I'd like to welcome you to the workshop. Hello, Dr. Hong, yeah. sorry. Hello, everybody, especially pa, pa Andy. Hello, long time no see. Uh, shall I, con uh, you control my slides or? Okay, yep. thank you very much. Okay. Uh, since I'm going to talk about rice, I just have a short introduction about rice. Rice is grown and feeding millions of people. It's, it's a wonderful crop. It has very few insect pests to, to think of. And those who are very destructive pests are actually secondary problems induced by insecticides. Uh, farmers, therefore, has very little or no productivity gain from insecticide use at all. And from our work, we found that more than 90% of the farmers' sprays are misuses. They are wrong timing, wrong target, wrong chemical, wrong concentration, and very uh, poor sprayers. So actually, farmers are better off if they are not using any insecticide. Next. Here is a piece of work done by some economists at Erie, and you will see that there are four treatments and the no spray with treatment is always coming on top. So the more sprays the farmer administer, the poorer is the benefit. Next price. Next one. Here are paired experiments. That means the same fields with the same farmer and there were nine, more than 900 farmers participating where they reduced insecticide use by 8, 78%. And the mean yield were even, in fact, a little bit higher. Thank you. Next slide, please. So it is, farmer sprays will cause other problems, environmental pollution and uh, health to themselves and the risk of destruction destruction pests like the brown plant hopper. Brown plant hopper, which is the most severe pest of rice today, is induced by insecticides which disrupt the natural biological control. The rice IPM programs have established, were established to teach farmers and make and so that they can rationalize and change their practices and reduce or completely stop insecticide use. Next one. A piece of work done by Professor Wei and I some years ago, we concluded that insecticides are really not needed in rice and so-called pests, which most entomologists list, should be reassessed before insecticide use is to be complemented. Next one. Next slide. And FAO in uh, 2012 actually adopted this principle that most tropical rice crops under even under intensification conditions require no insecticides. Next slide, please. This is a slide of Indonesia, Payandi. You will notice that uh, from 1985 to the year 2000, uh, uh, almost 2000, the rapid Rapid reduction of insecticides were primarily because of subsidy reduction. And, it, and uh, farmer fuel schools were introduced in 1990. And even as farmer fuel schools were introduced, insecticide use had, uh, were increasing. Next slide, please. Here's a slide showing the flow of insecticide use over, over the years. And you will notice that as farmer fuel schools funding stopped around early 2000, insecticide use escalated. Next slide, please. And 
why was insect rice IPM program not sustainable? So in the 1980s and 2000s, a lot of money had been spent to, to educate or train farmers in intensive training by farmer field schools. And at least 5 million of these rice farmers were so-called FFS graduates. So when the donor money stopped, FFS trained farmers returned to their old practices using calendar spraying. Next slide, please. Here's a recent slide uh, provided to me by James Fox, James Fox of Australia and Unita of Indonesia. And you will notice that most farmers in this area were spraying seven to 10 times where actually they are not necessary to spray any. Next slide, please. Why such huge investments were not sustainable? And here are some of the lessons we, we, we should learn from. Two things stand out very clearly. One was training will focus primarily on knowledge with insufficient ecological content. And farmers' knowledge increase, but they have limited understanding. The governing systems were not reformed to support any of those changes. Next slide, please. I shall start with governing uh, policies. There are perhaps two sets of governance policies. One is those policies that counter the new, new practices, and the other one are sets of policies that will enable the use of uh, the new technologies. Next slide, please. Those counter ones. Those counter ones are really existing policies uh, in, in, the, in, in the field of in various countries. For example, Poisons Act. In many countries in Asia, they have Poisons Act, but pesticides are not included as poisons. And therefore, pesticides continue to be sold as pro uh, consumer products. FMCG, fast moving consumer products. And also they usually uh, very weak implementation of, uh, of the policies. Malaysia, for example, uh, the Pesticide Act has, is very poorly funded in implementation and understaffed. Corruption is a huge problem in many countries, example, Thailand and Vietnam and implementers sometimes are under threat from hired gangsters when they visit uh, the fields, uh, namely Vietnam and Malaysia. Next slide, please. Here is a piece of paper, a paper published uh, in, in 2013 about in Vietnam in particular. So despite of very advanced new regulations developed and policies developed, the government were unable to regulate pesticide uh, market. This is primarily due to, from this paper, weak governance structure, large corruption, too close relationship with farmer, uh, with the government and the pesticide industry, and information distortion through sales promotions. Next slide, please. Why is insecticide overuse so rampant? What are the main forces. Next slide. Next slide, please. First, as I just mentioned, is because far pesticides are sold as consumer products. When and pesticides are sold as consumer products, they completely counter all the principles of IPM. Uh, I give you an example. Uh, insecticide use in IPM should be based on economic rationale. But when a insecticides are sold as a consumer product, it will be based on emotions, desires, and fear, and uh, perceptions, and the sense, and of, of course, the price. Next slide, please. And the, there is very abundant use of fake information in, in the marketplace. Uh, fake information such as insects are always needed when you want yield, and when farmers listen to this, they, they react. Uh, we are getting new pests because of climate change and, and so on. Things like these are very uh, 
farmers are very vulnerable to this kind of fake information. Next slide, please. The enabling policies, there are not many in Asia, in Southeast Asia. I want to give an example, and that is the Korean, Korean Environmental Friendly Act. In Korea, they enacted this act uh, many years, several years ago, to, to incentivize the, the use of sustainable technology in, in farming. And they develop a new department and new staff and new buildings so that they can implement this act. Next slide, please. This act, in this act, uh, some of the important features are like they promoting permaculture, which is a production system that mimics the vegetable, uh, plant, uh, vegetables and plants growing in nature, aquaponics and hydroponics, crop rotation, and uh, planting of trees and other crops around the, on the rice, which is, which is ecological engineering and huge pesticide reduction programs and use of eco-friendly pesticide pest management methods. Next slide, please. What have the, the eco-friendly eco products means that they are either using less insecticide or use of, uh, and uh, using biological methods. They develop a certification program and labeling pro and, and labeling uh, program to facilitate the, the use of these products, and uh, and also there are fines imposed uh, by if they are non-compliance. Next slide, please. And as a result, in Korea, you see this kind of landscape. Next slide. And another example of landscape where farmers actually plant flowers and, and they are credited for planting flowers next to their rice fields. Next, next slide, please. What happened? Pest, uh, fertilizer use in Korea dropped immediately, almost after the implement, uh, introduction of the new act. Next slide. Insect Decide use also drop. In addition, they introduced a new, a new uh, act called the Insect Industry Act to promote the use of insects at, as biological control agents. Next slide. Next is next reason why this is uh, the lack of adoption is the lack of ecological literacy. And this deepens farmers' pesticide dependence. Next slide, please. Training focus on information and uh, knowledge and skills. However, this not necessarily translate into improving their understanding and decision and practices. In most cases, sometimes after training, there is a temporary change in farmers' uh, practice, but this is as unsustainable and quickly farmers quickly revert back to using pesticide as before. So, like for example, most farmers are taught to recognize spiders, but they never understood the biological control dynamics of what spiders do. Next slide, please. So in our work, we try to try to understand farmers and the tools we use were a, a, a complex of many and I just introduce, discuss a few. One is what we call ethnoscience. This is a study of folk information, folk knowledge, folk concepts, and folk classification, so that they, we can understand how farmers see the world. We also discover the languages and uh, words the farmers use to refer to various co concepts and to discover their and also to discover their attitudes towards pest losses. Farmers are loss adverse. They are not risk adverse as we are all completely mistaken. Loss, they are afraid to lose something rather than uh, afraid to take the risk. All these studies are important so that we can understand how we can develop innovations to improve communication. Next slide. 
Another set of uh, techniques we use were what we call focus group discussions and uh, knowledge attitude practice surveys. Focus group discussions or FGGs are conducted in small groups and uh, in a farm setting where we sit around, around the area drinking, drinking tea. And the purpose is to discover how, the hows, the whys, the whats and the wheres from the farmer themselves. These findings are then developed into belief uh, questions to, to measure belief attitudes and changes. And then they are put in place into KAP surveys so that we can discover how extensive such particular attitudes and beliefs are in certain areas. And the results are used to develop communication approaches. Next slide. From people making decisions, we adopt a few concepts from, uh, from psychology. And one of, one of the concepts of psychology is how farmers make decisions. They usually use a satisficing model and very simple and frugal in rationality, the, the attitudes, and, and they rely primarily on what we call rules of thumb, simple rules of thumb or heuristics. Next slide, please. Because those rules are within farmers, they, have, they set up the rules over the years, they tend to have some uh, error prone. And it is our job as a researchers to discover what are the errors or biases of the farmers rules and then develop interventions to, to overcome their, their decision-making process. Next slide, please. This is generally how we develop those rules. The rules need to be meaningful for the farmer's setting and consistent to the ways they see the world and something and a rule that something they can act on. Next slide, please. So the use of communication uh, rules of psychology was, was used many, many, on many occasions to develop games, analogies, farmer experiments, so as to enhance the learning of uh, ecology. And then we have techniques to communicate these rules over a wide area because there are millions of farmers and uh, training them in small groups are going to take a lot of money and time. And uh, I shall discuss a little about multimedia campaigns, education, entertainment education programs to upscale to millions. Next slide, please. One uh, principle we use was cognitive dissonance technique. You see many farmers, uh, many rice farmers like to spray the crop early in the season. They think that by doing that, they will protect their fields, but this is completely reversed. Uh, uh, when ecological research show that this, this is more unnecessary, wasteful, and even damaging. Because at the early stages, huge diversity of predators migrate into the field from neighboring habitats, and the spraying will be counterproductive. Next slide, please. And because also because of plant compensation abilities, the small damages on the leaves in at the early stages have little mean, little yield consequence. Thus, using all these concepts, we distill into a simple rule. Spraying in the first 40 days of your crop is not necessary. Now, when farmers were presented with this rule, which is complete in complete conflict of what their normal thinking, they are in cognitive dissonance. And to help farmers resolve this dissonance, we invite them into to perform experiments with us uh, where half his field will not receive any insecticide in the first 40 days. Next slide. Here is an example of one of those experiments and you, we, sh we show here, farmers re reduce their sprays from three to two and then finally to one and then zero. Farmers spraying 
early in the crop reduced from 68% to 20% and then to 11%. And the main change of the of were beliefs in the leaf feeding insects. They changed from uh, believing that they were causing severe damage, U loss, and had to be sprayed early were all re much reduced. Next slide. We use multimedia campaign so as to reach as many as people as possible. And uh, one of the way, one of the example I want to show, share with you is in the Mekong Delta. The, it is called Bagyam Batang, three reduction, three gains. And the campaign was using leaflets, uh, billboards, and, and was launched by uh, the minister. Uh, and, uh, and we found that farmers' practices changed significantly. Next slide. Here's an example of those uh, leaflets and uh, posters. Next slide. And an example of billboards along the roadside. Next slide. Some results, and you see that uh, in, in two problems, you see that there's a mark reduction before and after of seed rate, nitrogen rate, and set drastically. Next slide. So in conclusion, the, that campaign, the sprays reduced from 13, about 13 to 33%, seed reduction reduced by 10%, and uh, nitrogen by uh, 7%. 7 there were marked changes in the uh, farmers' beliefs, in, in, and, and that has made them sustain those practices. The Ministry of Ag Agriculture of Vietnam adopted this Bagyam Batang principle and, and then further introduced to other provinces, which we estimate eventually reach about 3 million farmers. Next slide, please. The next, the last uh, topic I'll talk about is ecological engineering. The aim of ecological engineering is to restore the biodiversity in the field and conserve, restore and conserve the biodiversity so as to increase the biological control ecosystem service. Next slide. We did a very large experiment over three countries in multiple years to, to ensure that this, this principle had worked. Next slide, please. So those fields with flowers and without flowers there was a marked decrease in insecticide of 70%. Next slide. And yields were increased in those fields with, uh, with flowers. We did a detailed uh, economic analysis of labor and materials used in the two practices and found that ecological engineering had a 7.5% increase in profits. Next slide. In addition, it also enhanced the local honey production. Next slide, please. You will see marked changes in the landscape in Vietnam. Next slide. Next slide. And here are some examples of those changes. Now, ecology, we use another technique to ex, uh, extend ecological engineering to farmers. And that was the ecological engineering television series. Next slide. And then we used the principles of edu education and ent entertainment education in, in order to develop this series. The purpose of that is to both entertain and educate farmers so as to change, change uh, create a favorable attitude so that, so that they can shift the norms into the new behavior. Next slide. Now, one of the important principles in the ecological engineering was to, to enable farmers to appreciate biological control. 
and one was and more in rice, the most important was parasitoids. Now, farmers have no concept what parasitoids are. They, to them, they are pets. And they also have no concept of what parasitism is. So since bees are bigger and easier to observe and well-known, we taught farmers to observe bee populations as indicator of parasitism. And parasitism, cons and then we created a new name called small bees for parasitoids. Next slide. In addition to that, in, in the television program, we introduced this whole concept in three simple rules. Flowers on the buns provide food to attract bees and small bees. Bees and small bees help me control brown hopper invading my fields so I don't need insecticides. And if I imply insecticides, it will kill the bees and small bees. Next slide. Here are some results and of the television viewers and non-viewers, and you will notice that there's marked increase, marked decrease in seed use, marked decrease in nitrogen rates, and marked decrease in 24% uh, of insecticide use. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to conclude because of time, and the main conclusions I have here are in order to promote uh, biological, uh, uh, to promote and practice biological control, we need to develop para in parallel ecological training of farmers who ultimately are the uh, implementers. This is the ecological knowledge or ecological principles will build their confidence of using the new practice. For researchers to learn, we need to, for researchers to learn farmers about the constraints the farmers face, their beliefs, the perceptions and practices. And we need to develop new innovate, innovative ways to communicate to these millions of farmers who need this help and in, to, for them to appreciate and practice biological control. Now, mass media is a powerful platform and uh, we need to develop innovative ways to, uh, to use ma mass media to cultivate these new norms. Also in parallel, we need to initiate policy and structural reforms in, or, or new policies to accommodate the new practices. Now, without these kind of reforms, the new practices, the new norms will not be sustainable. As, as you can see in the IPM FFS programs. So we need to identify opportunities for new policies so as to make adjustments to the current one in order for us to implement a sustainable uh, implementation of biological control or ag in agriculture. Thank you very much. Any questions, I'm, I'll be pleased to, to answer. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hong. I hope uh, everyone can hear me now. And that was a uh, extremely excellent, very detailed presentation. There's a lot of food for thought. And I just want to remind everyone that a copy of the presentations today and the recording will be posted on our website later in the week. Um, I also encourage you now, if you've got any questions for Dr. Hong, to put them in the Q&A box. Um, Dr. Hong, you, you talked about a lot of interesting points and it's quite hard to know where to start, but I found a particular comment quite important and that was your view that farmers are loss averse, not risk averse, because we often hear that farmers don't want to take risks, but I think the way you frame it here really resonates uh, as well as smallholder farmers being loss averse, not risk averse. Do you have any further examples of how to use this in the design of a program? For example, could it be that insurance policies for smallholder farmers could be important here as a way to support their that loss averse or that behavioural change uh, thinking? H how do you s sort of support them? I... I uh... Part of it I could not hear because there was some flux in the internet. But uh, I did hear about insurance policy. Is that yes. what you? Yes. Yeah. yes, I'm just thinking of a way to support farmers to take on that sort of to make them less loss averse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. So uh, during the Green Revolution, insur insurance policy was introduced. Now the, the trouble with the insurance policy at that time was the insurance companies tie up with the chemical companies and, uh, and, and farmers buying the insurance have to follow a schedule and, uh, in order to, to gain from, uh, if they have a pass outbreak, to gain the, the, the repayment from the insurance company. Now, it is extremely difficult to, to, for, to develop an insurance that requires to do nothing, you know? So my brother is an insurance agent and I described the problem to him. And I said, I like to develop something uh, like that. And he said that if that is the case, farmer, people will learn that they don't need to pay the premium and eventually the company will lose money. So no insurance company will take this up. So our, our objective in the insurance company, in insurance policy, is to ensure that the farmers don't need to, to, to spray, and mm -hmm. which is completely, is a difficult thing to implement. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've got a few questions here coming in from the audience. Uh, the question here is, does the data around pesticide use, does it also include fungicide? Uh, most of the data I presented were primary insecticides, so okay. uh, not, not, not necessarily fungicide, no. Uh, Here's a question. How long does it take to change farmers' practices? Almost instantly, if they understood and appreciate the concepts behind it and uh, feel very confident that whatever they're doing will not render them crop losses. So it's almost immediate. So if you teach them to recognize the natural enemies, that's not enough. You need to demonstrate uh, how those natural enemies help them and how by spraying actually will destroy it. And uh, that, that kind of training. So that if the training includes those kinds of things, there's a little more chance that they will have uh, more uh, confidence in the new practice. Great, that's an important point. Um, great answer. Here's a question from Susan Knight. Uh, thank you for your very thought provoking talk. I agree there is an urgent need to increase ecological literacy. Can more be done to educate younger people, the next generation farmers, since they may be more receptive? And can such subjects be included in the school curriculum? Mm -hmm. We actually tried that in uh, Thailand, uh, where we tried to include uh, uh, ecological content into uh, high school uh, students. We did that for two years, uh, high school. The problem is uh, in, a, in a country like Thailand, less than 10% of the farmers, uh, of the children we trained went on to farming. So kind of hard in a sense to re retain, uh, retain uh, that kind of information, uh, that kind of uh, training in, in, the, in the market, in the real marketplace. So most of them just gave up training. After high school, they, they do not go, they do not go farming. Oh, interesting point. Uh, and for those that did continue, did, was, was that potentially useful for that 10% though? Yeah, those who, those who, who did follow, I mean, uh, who had that, had that uh, training, did who did, and and then uh, went back to farming. Did have that knowledge, but the problem is he has to uh, deal with his father, who has a very deep feeling of the of pesticides, and uh. in those farm areas, the the only advisor of pest management are the pesticide salesmen. So, so he's you know. He has the new knowledge, but no confidence to practice it because his father tells him that he will lose his crop. So that becomes a, a, a deterrent. There was no, as I said, it, it, it boils down to the policy. There was no policy to remove some of the uh, unfavorable conditions. Uh, excellent. And I think that actually leads us to another question here. Olivia Reynolds said, terrific presentation, thank you. Can you please elaborate how you ensure that these farmer behavioral changes and practices have a legacy, that they're continually implemented by farmers? 
For example, do media campaigns need to run long term? Do you work with government to ensure government policies are reflective of these changes? I think you just alluded to that, that the policy needs to be in parallel. Do, how long do these media mm -hmm. campaigns need to continue, do you think? Those media campaigns or television programs needs to continue for a couple of years and with the support of the government. And in parallel, the government need to make some modification and adjustment to some uh, constraints in the environment for these practices to carry on. And if those uh, policies were not adjusted, uh, and as soon as those programs uh, go away or stop, people return, return to their old practices. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. That's probably a good place to leave it. Um, excellent presentation. I'm so uh, full of detailed information. Um, you've got a few questions still there, actually quite a few, Dr. Hong. If you could just um, jump on the Q&A, you'll be able to yeah. answer some of those questions in writing and we would really appreciate okay. that. But thank, thank you so much for, for coming on and sharing your, you know, huge experience and knowledge on the subject. We, we really value that. So thank you very much.